raised him. And then his wife gave her heart to Jesus, and, and we baptized her in our bathtub. So, you know, <laughs> when you're kind to people, you know, they can tell a fake. But when you're genuinely kind to people, it's amazing. And I was going to tell a testimony. You were talking about, you know, reaching out to people. You know, just, just being somebody's friend. You know, your actions speak louder than your words. And so it's, it's your actions of love and genuine kindness to people that, that really hits them. And um, we, a lot of our, our ministry is relationship. We preach in churches, yes, we do a lot of teaching and that. But a lot of it is just going to a restaurant or a grocery store and getting to know the people who work there. And getting to know them by name, and, and are they married, and how many children they have. And the next time I go back, I call them by name, and I talk to ask them about their family and things like that. And there's this one young man that works in one of the restaurants that we go to, and, and he's full of tattoos, and, and uh, um, he's got a crazy haircut, and, and uh, anyway, and, and I, I, we just talk to him, and and after a period of time, before I'd leave, I'd, I'd give him a hug. Well, this last, this last spring we were there, um, for about three times in a row that I went there, I didn't give him a hug when we left, because he was busy. He was busy taking care of customers. And uh, then about the fourth time, I went in, and I just called in an order to pick up some food. So when I got there, he was mopping the floors, and so I said, hi, Ricky, how you doing, and talked to him a while, and, and picked up my order, and he says, Pastor, he says, can I have a hug? He said, the last few times you've come, I've been so busy, I haven't gotten a hug, and he says, it just does something to me, and I just hugged on that young man, and I said, you know who this hug is really from? Yeah, I know, and I said, yeah, I said it's from Jesus. Because Jesus is the one that's really hugging you. You know, and he feels that. And I'm just praying that, that he will, will, will one day give his life to Jesus. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> I'm going to talk to you about <clears throat> recognizing Christ's worth. Really recognizing the treasure we have in a relationship with Jesus. And we're going to turn to Matthew 13. Might be a, a, a passage that you've heard at some point. Matthew 13, verse 44. It says, the, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man, man found and hid. And for joy over it, he give, goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and brought it. Let's, uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just come before you in the name of Jesus, and we just ask, Holy Spirit, that you would open up our hearts, open up our minds, open up our ears, that we'd hear what you, the preacher, has to say tonight. Lord, that we would receive from you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So what do you treasure? Do you treasure family? Do you treasure money? Do you treasure your home? Do you treasure your church? Your church? You know, words are cheap, like I said. You know, we can go around and we can talk Christianese to people. You know Christianese? <laughs> but when, they, when you really talk to, show, show the love of Christ to people, that's when they really know that you're genuine. They can, like I said, people can, can spot a fake. And, and there are times, you know, there's times in my life that, that I wondered, where am I investing my treasure? What is my treasure? What, what am I investing in? You know, where, where we invest our time, where we invest our energy, that's where our real treasure is. And there's times in my life when I'm wondered, really wondered what it, what it means to follow Christ. Am I really giving my all for him? Because I want you to know he gave his all for us. Amen? And I find myself only giving him part of me. 
because I'm, I've still got a foot in the world. I've still got a foot following after the things of this world. And uh, I was double-minded when I really wanted to be single-minded. And I tell Jesus that I want to stay close to him, but I, then I find myself drifting. You know, if you find, feel like Jesus is distant, when you feel God is distant, I want you to know he's not the one that moved. Mm -hmm. You know, we're the one that start to, to get astray away. We're the ones that move. He stays stable, but he never takes his eyes off of us. <coughs> So what turns half-hearted believers into wholehearted followers of Christ? What really changes that in our life? And it's, it's, first of all, of course, it starts with an experience and a relationship with Jesus. And understanding it's much more than religion. <coughs> there are a lot, a lot of religious people out there. I mean, they are so good at being religious. But they don't understand a real relationship. They don't understand that, that Jesus loved what he really, really did for us, what he sacrificed for us. So we are looking at this story and there are two men that are willing to give up everything they own so that they could possess this treasure. The one man was found this land and he was willing to sell everything so he could buy that land. And the other guy, he found a pearl and he was going to sell everything so he could get that pearl. So what do we treasure in our life? That we're willing to give up everything in order to have that. Are we really willing to lay down our flesh, the things that we desire in our flesh, to really serve our King of Kings and our Lord of Lords? In these, par this, these parables, it begins when one man discovers a treasure hidden in a field, and then there's another man that discovers this pearl of great worth. <coughs> the principle is so simple. It, commitment to Christ begins when we discover him. You know, sometimes each one of us have a, a different way that we discovered a relationship with Jesus. Some people are searching. They're going to every religion they can think of. They're trying them all out because they want, they're looking for something. They just don't even know what they're looking for. But they're looking. And then there's other people who kind of fall into a relationship with Jesus kind of like by accident. They just kind of like ended up on the streets and walking the streets and here this guy comes up with a cross. Starts telling them about Jesus. They weren't looking for him, but all of a sudden they run into someone at a restaurant, at a store, at a restaurant, at a, you know, just walking down the street. And there's someone there who's willing to, to, to step out, even when they're afraid, they're doing it afraid, and say, you know what? I want to tell you about something that happened in my life. So you can start preaching at somebody and maybe turn them off, but when you start to share with them what God did in your life, it perks up their ears. And they want to hear about that because they're looking for something in their own life. One thing that these parables teach us is that different people discover the truth of Jesus in different ways. There was a young man that we were, we were just walking down the street in downtown San Ignacio in Belize. <clears throat> and kind of out of nowhere, this young man walks up to me. And he says, lady, and I looked and he says, I see love in your eyes. I mean, I was just walking down the street. And so I started talking to this young man. Here he was a drug dealer and he was a gang leader. And I spent about an hour talking to him. My husband came, he came and joined us a little while later and we started just, just sharing the love of Christ with this young man. Started telling us a little bit about himself. And we invited him to church, he came to church. We invited him to church another time, he came to church. 
And his birthday ended up being the same day as my husband's birthday. And he was going to be turning 38 years old. And he said, I've never had a birthday party. When he was born, his mother gave birth to him right in the doorway and left him there. And sometime later, his, mother, his grandmother came along and heard him crying and came along and took him and she raised him. So talk about rejection. Many of you have felt rejected. Rejected by your parents, rejected by loved ones, whatever. There's a lot of rejection. But I want you to know Jesus doesn't reject you. He, he embraces you. And so I thought, you know what? I'm going to give this young man a birthday party. So I, he, he, he lives in the slums in a gang, gang area that, you know, it's probably not very wise for somebody like me to go walking into. But I went there with my pot of spaghetti sauce and my spaghetti. I went to his house and I yelled to the neighbors, come on, we're gonna have a birthday party. I went back in the backyard and some guys were sitting around drinking rum and smoking dope. And I said, come on in, we're gonna have a birthday party. <laughs> and we all sat around and, and you know, before we eat, we pray. So I got to pray with all those guys. Maybe they weren't planning on praying, but guess what? They prayed because we were going to eat. And Edric sat there, and I bought him a present. He just sat there and just wept. He says, I've never had anybody do anything like this for me. That was Jesus. Because every good gift comes from Jesus. He uses people... But if you receive a good gift, it comes from him. Amen. He is the one that is giving you that good gift. In the first parable, we find a man who isn't even looking for a treasure. He just kind of stumbles on it. It was an accident. But boy, he recognized that it was a great thing. And man, he, he couldn't hardly wait to... To, to get someplace and sell everything so he can go buy, buy that piece of property. And the, and the exactly opposite happened in the second parable. This merchant was looking. He was looking. He was searching. Just like I said, some people are searching. They just don't even know what it is they're looking for. But this guy, he knew what he was looking for. <coughs> Often real treasure is hidden. Many people can focus on the present. We have many shallow and external uh, surface type of, 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 uh, of things that we're looking for. The treasure was hidden from the eye and it would take much effort to require and to obtain uh, this pearl of, of great price. Others just see a field. They just see a person. They just see a, a cab driver, or they just see a clerk at a grocery store, or they see someone sweeping the streets. But I want you to know when Jesus sees them, he sees somebody valuable. He saw, he saw a treasure. I want you to know each one of you is a treasure. A treasure that Jesus said, you know what? I'm going to die for that person because I want them to experience everything that they can possibly experience by going to heaven Amen. so he paid the price for us because he saw the value in you some of you here today had no intentions of ever following Christ for a good part of your life you didn't even think about God that was nothing but part of your language you didn't care about God. You were just living a life, minding your own business, and then wham, out of nowhere, Jesus comes and knocks on your door. <clears throat> the good news of Jesus come expectantly and broke into your life. You weren't looking for God, but I want you to know he was looking for you. Amen. He's waiting with open arms, just waiting See, he's a gentleman. The Holy Spirit's a gentleman. He's not going to push yourself, him himself on you. He's going to give you every opportunity 
to choose for yourself to receive him, but he will not force himself. Wouldn't it be just so much easier if God would just say, you know what, everybody's going to go to heaven, you know, everyone's going to serve me, we'd have peace on earth, hallelujah, amen. But see, sin came into the world. And all the mess in the world is not from God, it's from the devil. There is a devil. Some people don't believe in devil. They don't believe there's a Satan. They don't believe there's a hell. But I want you to know, when you die, there's only two places you can go, either heaven or hell. There's no purgatory. There's no place of sleep. There's no place of just, okay, I get to just rest in peace. But you get to make the choice. You can either go to heaven or you can go to hell. <clears throat> On the other hand, some of us have had a different experience. It seems that some people are born with an acute spiritual, you know, a reality that, you know, there's something spiritual out there and you're longing for it. And maybe you went from one philosophy to another, in a religion like I talked about. And then someone, someone someday, one day came and told you about Jesus. It's about a relationship. And you, you caught on. It, it opened up in your heart and you said, yeah, that makes sense to me. Because the Holy Spirit drew you. One day, I remember the first time we ever took a ferry down in Belize, took a ferry from the mainland to, <clears throat> to the island. I had never, never been on the Caribbean, never been in tropical, you know, uh, when I was a real little girl three, four years old, my parents were missionaries down in Trinidad and the Caribbean, but, you know, I was really little. <clears throat> so we're, <clears throat> we're taking this ferry, and John went and had to go sit in one place, and I had to sit up in the front with it by next to this young man, and he had this huge TV that he was trying to balance, and, and I sat there, and I'm, I'm like, I'm always looking for an opportunity, <laughs> an opportunity somehow. And I'm just a people person. And, and I looked at this young man, and I introduced myself. <clears throat> and, uh, and then I said, Lord, how can I talk to this young man? Give me, give me a way that I can talk to him. And one of the things that Lord has really put in me is an opportunity of a way to get people to ask me the right questions. And you know, if you get someone to ask you the right question, guess what? We've got the right answer. We've got the word of God, and there's the right answer in there. And so he had tattoos all up and down his arms. And so I thought, well, most of these guys, they, they got they tattoos. They, they're proud of them. So I said, well, Kareem, I see you've got all kinds of artwork on your arms. I said, can you tell me about it? So he started telling me. And he says, yeah, my brother did most of this artwork. And my brother got killed um, in some gang warfare. And then, you know, we're chatting, and he says, where do you think my brother is? I did not introduce myself as Pastor Colleen. I just said, I'm Colleen. But there was something in him that told him I, he could ask me that question. And I said, well, Kareem, I said, I don't know where your brother is. But I said, I can tell you that you can know where you're going to go. And I, I started, he, he had... He had tombstones, three tombstones on the inside of his arm. And, and I said, what do they represent? And he started telling me the names of the people that it represent that got killed in gang warfare. So I started talking to him about the love of Christ. And it's about a 45-minute ride from the mainland to, the, to where we drop off at the island. And by the time we were pulling up to the, to the island, he was praying to ask Jesus Christ with his heart. And he went on to the next island. Well, of course, I just had him in my heart so heavy, and I wanted to bring him a Bible. So I found a Bible, and we took a ferry over to the next island. Well, I knew his name, and I knew he was a tattoo artist, but I didn't know anything else about him. <clears throat> so I, I, I'm on an island. This is a bigger island. And I'm just walking up and straight down the streets, and I said, Hey, you know, Kareem Sosa, he's a, a tattoo artist. 
No, I don't know. And I said, well, do you know any tattoo artists around? Any, anybody who does tattoo, you know? And people couldn't help me. And I kept looking and looking. Sometimes we have to search people out. I spent about 45 minutes walking up and down the streets. And finally someone said, well, I think on the other side over that way, there's, I think there's a little tattoo shop there. So I walked over there and sure enough, there he was. And he was so surprised to see me. And he introduced me to his wife and I gave him his Bible and showed him some scripture and prayed with him. And uh, recently I reached out to him again, I, I have over the years, and, and, uh, and he's still serving Jesus. But you know, there are counterfeit pearls that distract and hinder us from real value. There's a lot of counterfeit out there, and people grab hold of that. They grab hold of a, a message that brings them comfort and ease. They like to go to a church where they hear warm fuzzies that makes them feel good when they leave. They feel good about themselves because, you know, they, they tell them how great they are and, and how wonderful they are. I want you to know you are wonderful. You are great in Christ. But I see, I want a message that, that brings me correction if I need correction. I want a message that, that tells me the truth, that I can't play around with this stuff. I can't play around with pornography if I'm serving Jesus. I can't play around with, with sleeping around. I can't play around uh, messing around with tarot cards and, 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 all, and astrology and all that kind of stuff. I can't play around with that stuff if I'm really serving Jesus. That's the truth. But see, a lot of people will, will make you, well, you're not so bad. Their, 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 their measurement is, is, the standard of measurement is according to how everybody else is. Well, I'm not as bad. I remember our, our son when he was a teenager, he said, well, mom, I'm not as bad as our friends. And I said, your standard of measurement is not your friends. Your standard of measurement is the word of God and what the word of God says. And as a mother, I had to teach him what the word of God says, not, well, I'm glad that you're not as bad as your friends. So just keep being a good boy, okay? <laughs> Sometimes the Lord has to come and give me a good spanking. Sometimes he corrects me and it makes me feel uncomfortable. But I'm grateful because I want to continue to grow. I have not arrived. I've got a long ways to go. God's still teaching me. But I need to be in the word and I need to be listening to the Holy Spirit speaking to me. And as long as we have a teachable spirit, we're in a safe place. As long as I realize that I need the Holy Spirit's guidance, I'm in the right place. But about the time I think, well, you know what, I'm, I'm a missionary, I'm doing a great job. Look at how good I am. That's when I'm in a bad, I'm in a tough space, I'm in a, a scary space. We need to be humble before the Lord, knowing how much we need him every day. Every day I need the Holy Spirit to come and convict me and to tap me on the shoulder and remind me, this is how you're supposed to live, Colleen. Watch your tongue. Watch how you talk about people. Watch your thoughts. Take your thoughts captive because I want you to know those thoughts will come in. It's, you can't avoid the thoughts coming in. It's what you do with the thoughts. And that's why we need to take those thoughts captive. <clears throat> so we can get so busy with busyness, with, with our business, trying to, build, trying to build, make money, with chasing, chasing riches, trying to seek honor, trying to, to get the applause of man. We can, these are all kinds of, of false pearls that we can be seeking after. <clears throat> and we're so busy learning, we learn more and more about less and less until finally we know everything about nothing. Hmm. Let me say that again. Learning, we learn more and more about less and less until finally we know everything about nothing. People can can seek after knowledge to know all kinds of things. 
But the, what is it gonna? What, what good is it gonna do? But when you're seeking the knowledge of the Son of God, you're seeking the knowledge of God's Word in your life. Man, it can benefit you. It, it's it's never ending. It's never ending. So that's a treasure. It's worth really investing in. Investing your time. Relationships. I love, like I said, to build relationships. I remember when I first went to Belize, I was trying to fit these Belizeans into the African box that I was used to. <laughs> it's a different culture. Even going now, we're, we're working in Guatemala and different culture. It's only like 20 minutes away. But different culture, different people. And so we need to be flexible and, and, and understand that people come from different areas and different walks of life and, and have different ways of thinking. They don't all think like we do. But finding the treasure is only the first step. It's not a, uh, enough just to simply discover Jesus. We need to have a commitment, a commitment to serve him, not to be a wishy-washy Christian and just, you know, add him to all of our other gods. See, that's one of the dangers that happens is sometimes when people don't really understand a commitment to Jesus, they just think, well, I'll have all my, ba my bases covered. I'll have Buddha there and I'll have the Hindu there and I'll have, you know, my Indian religions and, and you know, they, they just add Jesus to all their other gods. But Jesus is the only way. God, our Father, is the only God. And in verse 46, Jesus tells us when the merchant found the pearl, he recognized what many, many other people never saw. So many people walked by that. They didn't understand the, or recognize the value. So many people have heard about this word, the, the word Jesus. They've heard the word God, but they have never recognized the man, Jesus and understand what he did for them. <clears throat> he gives us forgiveness instead of judgment, and he gives us life instead of death. There was a very poor rich man, it tells us in Matthew 19, verse 16 through 22. There's a young man who came to Jesus, and he said, how can I, you know, how can I follow you? And he says, well, he said, you know, you got to follow the Ten Commandments and, and all. He said, well, I've done all those things all my life. And he says, well, then sell everything and give, you know, and give everything up and follow me. And that young man just could not handle, could not handle that. He did not want to let go of it because it was so valuable to him that he actually died within his riches. It reminds me of the story of a of a jar with a peanut in it and a monkey come along and saw that peanut and he was so excited and he put his hand in that peanut and grabbed hold of that jar and grabbed hold of that peanut. Well then, because he had the, the peanut in his fist, he couldn't pull the, the fist right back out of the jar. But you know what? Rather than letting go of that peanut and being able to be free, he ended up starving to death, hanging on to what he thought was so valuable because he, he couldn't get his hand out of that, out of that jar. So what are we hanging on to so, that we think is so valuable, we will not let go of it and really s serve Jesus? There are some things in our life that we need to sacrifice, we need to let go of so that we can follow Jesus. But too many times, we've got this ball and chain and we really don't want to get, have it cut off. We don't really want to be free of it because there's security in that ball and chain because we've been walking all these years with this ball and chain. And there kind of feels, it feels like a safety there. But see, we can die with that ball and chain. But in order to really have freedom, we've got to let go. We've got to let go and let God. And just give him our whole life. A lot of people are willing to give him part of their life. But God wants us to give him all our life.
Our value system seems to be hinged on money or pleasure. And in Matthew 16, 26, it says, For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his own soul? Money, it seems, can buy everything, but you can't buy your salvation. There are so many people who are rich. They have, they have all the riches in the world. But you know, when they die, they, they will have nothing. They will, not, they will not go to heaven because they've never given their life to Jesus Christ. So what good did it do? What do, good does it do them into, into eternity? Because they're holding on to that, that, that gold. And have you ever noticed how useless gold really is? It's too soft to make anything. You've got to add other metals to it to make jewelry out of it. You can't make clothing out of it. You can't walk on it because it's so soft. You can't make a foundation with it. And yet people value gold more than they do other people. I want you to know each one of you is valuable. You are a treasure. You are a treasure that some people don't, it's kind of like a diamond in a rough. People don't see what's in there, but I want you to know God sees every facet that he is developing in you. And he's going to keep developing and cutting and refining you until he can see the image of Jesus in you. That's what I want, is I want when people see me, when they look at me, that they see Jesus. A lot of our society today does not put much value in family, and yet family is so important. I love the church family. Church family is so important. Some people say, well, I don't need to go to church. I can sit at home and, and watch church on TV. Yes, you can. But there's something about community. A lot of you guys are, are, are part of Team Challenge. You've got a community there. You kind of support each other. You've got someone to come and, and come on, you can make it. Someone to give you an encouraging word. We all need that. I need encouragement. How about friendship? Understanding the value of a real friend. There's so many people that are just, you know, they're fly-by-night friends. You can't trust them. Many see the value of something today, but we need to see the potential. Just like I said, God sees you. You know, the fact that I'm standing behind the pulpit does not make my ministry any more valuable than what God called you to do. Amen. He's got something that he wants you to do. I could never do it. But he has fashioned that thing that he wants you to do. He's purposed it for you. And if you won't do it, he'll find someone else, but they're not going to do it quite as good because he fashioned it for you to do. So each one of you has a ministry that God wants to use to build his kingdom. Each one of you has a ministry that is so vital for building the kingdom of God. But he wants someone to say, I'm available. Not to say, well, I don't know how I can do it. I'm not a very good speaker. I, I don't have money. I don't have that many talents. I want you to know every single person was designed with your, with your abilities and your talents to build the kingdom of God. That's what you were built for. To bring glory to the king of kings and the Lord of lords. <clears throat> Jesus is telling us over and over. We talk about sacrifices and, that we make for Jesus. And here what we all, here's what we all need to see in this parable. There's no sacrifice at all. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden. That when the man found it, he hid it again. And then he went with joy and sold everything to be able to acquire it. How, po is, it, how is it possible for someone to give up everything they possess with laughter and joy? This man was so excited 
because he understood the potential in that land. Empty the bank accounts, dump the cars, dump the jewelry, dump the gold, everything to be able to buy that land. <clears throat> the kingdom of heaven is about trading hell for heaven. It's about trading temporary trinkets for eternal riches. It's about trading shame for joy. To walk in shame all the time. How can you have joy? But boy, the freedom of knowing you've been forgiven so that you can walk in joy. How beautiful that is. It's trading rejection for acceptance. It's trading fear and emptiness for love. And never being, dis being disappointed, having somebody disappointed with you. I want you to know God is not disappointed in you. When you fail, he's not sitting up there saying, what is wrong with that? He didn't, when I fail, he doesn't say, what's wrong with that Colleen? I can't figure her out. I, I give her all the options. I give her all the tools, and she still messes up. God doesn't sit up there and say, he dances over me. He rejoices over me. He loves me so much. He's looking for me to be successful. That's what he wants. He wants me to surrender everything that I have to him, knowing that I need him on a daily basis. Whatever it is, know this, it's not worth what he's worth. Whatever it is you're still hanging on to has not even close to the value of what he is worth. Discover Jesus and recognize his worth. Don't see the treasure he is to you. Isn't it time that you really enjoy the love and the life of, of, of walking with Jesus? There's such a treasure in that. Amen? Many of you have, maybe you have family that have told you how disappointed they are in you. And all you hear is what a failure you are and what a mess up you are and they make you feel low. But I want to be here today to tell you that Jesus loves you. He loves you just the way you are, but he loves you enough not to leave you that way. He wants to change you. He wants to refine you. And I encourage you because we all mess up. When you mess up, repent quickly. Too many people are so embarrassed that they won't even repent. They just hang on to it. They beat themselves up. I messed up again, but I encourage you, repent quickly. Lord, I messed up. Ask you to forgive me, cleanse me, and give me the willpower, the strength, the grace that I need to keep going forward. You know what? God loves you. He'll forgive you. Amen. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for your goodness and we thank you for your grace in our lives. and We thank you that for the treasure that you have given us when you sent your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Jesus, that you came and you forgave us, that you washed us with your blood. We thank you, Lord, that you are alive today and you're here to be with us, that you're praying for us, you're our advocate. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you convict us, that you would refine us, that you'd continue to work in our lives and help us to, to be good listeners to you when you're trying to speak to us, that we, that we hear quickly 
and that we're obedient, Lord. We give you praise, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen. We will, we will be here um, to pray for anyone that would like prayer.